That's very interesting. Which brings me to that. That's a nice switch of topics because it that, that was sort of my next question. Uh, this is not an audit, and your life doesn't really depend on it. Uh, that's typically the message that each SAM assessment start with, at least in my experience. And I see nobody disagrees there. My question is, where do you strike the balance between being a friend who, who's going to teach them, but also making sure that they don't exaggerate slash lie, whether consciously or subconsciously, because eventually you're, you're getting evaluated at the end of the day. It's an assessment. It's not a, it's not a webinar. So what, what would be the other tips and tricks? Well, Rob already mentioned one, um, but I, I would really love to hear more tactics of how do you set the stage? Even if you have trust, they might still sort of exaggerate a little bit, not too much, but how, how do you, where do you push? How do you get to the detail, to the bottom of things? And is that really, really important if they get half a score more or less? So it's it's a long question, I know, but whatever your answer is good, because my question is probably going to be, I can still also rephrase my question when I'm building the the, the final recording. Brian, I would like to start with you. So for me, as Rob mentioned, and we've talked about, trust is paramount. So when we go when i go in there it is very much this is for your benefit this is for you to tell a story there are no names associated with anything we record you know this is just in general hey somebody mentioned this this is what's working this is what's not um trying to cuz especially the more trust you build the more honest they're going to be likely to be yeah. now you have to deal with interesting things too where depending on who you're talking to, what part of the world they're from, what culture they have, some cultures are more prone to exaggerate because that's normal for their culture. It's saving face or whatever is going on in their area. And so you have to be cognizant of this and then be careful about how you ask questions, how you pry, how you dig so that you can gently work around and figure out is what I'm hearing accurate and is there other ways to verify? It? So it's kind of like doing a survey where you ask the same question in two slightly different ways and you're trying to verify whether that first answer is really the answer. And you have to it's it's not necessarily a game, but it's kind of like a game. You have to work through it. And so that's part of the reason, and I'm pretty sure we all do this, we don't do assessments by just asking the questions in the same questionnaire. The questionnaire has questions that need to be scored, yes, but the value that a third party brings is that interpretation and the, the ability to ferret out what is actually happening, not what we would want to happen, not what we think other people want to happen, but what is actually going on. And so that trust is huge, being able to do that, to try and make sure that you can speak openly without being punished. And that's that's one of the harder things. And But to be honest, when I go back to third party assessments, I found people far more willing to trust a third party consultant that is completely neutral than they are to trust even an internal representative somewhere. Um, because I don't have like one, I don't really have a reason to badmouth anybody. That doesn't do me any good. So they for them it's less likely to happen. But it's I don't know. I mean I this for me, that trust is a lot. Building that rapport, like Rob mentioned, if you can, even if there's a few minutes of light talk beforehand to establish common grounds of things that people like or don't like, if you can 
respond to them talking about something and say, I've experienced this before, or you have your own anecdote or your own story about where you've encountered that, that helps them be more comfortable with understanding that they're talking to another human and one that can empathize with what they're dealing with. And that's huge. So small talk is key. I would like to switch to Rob because I know Rob also is part of several ISO uh, working groups. Probably correct me if I'm wrong. And I know like jokes are really forbidden there. Mm. Can you still do small talk without jokes, Rob? And you can, by the way, you can also answer the previous question in combination with this one. Yeah, funny. So while Brian was explaining this, I I I I, I thought of that. I thought of the fact that in very international settings uh you need to be careful with uh with humor and I, i've learned that the hard way so that requires some some tactful uh, experience with different cultures iso is extreme because you're sitting with people from all over the world in one room uh, but i would behave differently in an interview setting with uh, a team uh, in Indonesia or a team in China or a team in uh, in Germany. It requires some cultural flexibility. And sometimes it's um, it's unknown ground and then you need to be uh, need to be careful. And maybe tone down a little bit on the humor, but of course, be cautious, be friendly, find common ground, connect, be respectful. Uh, be humble. You need you need help yeah. to gain insight. You're not, you know, yeah. the big guru that's uh, that's that, that's that's coming in. And at the same time, you want to be authentic. So good luck with that. It's <laughs> it's it's pretty hard. And there are all kinds of sort of tricks to get to get to the truth. Uh, I'm not referring to medieval torture or or waterboarding. Although I, I I've never tried it with teams, but what really helps is um, just for the team to know that you have access to artifacts, that you can look up in their version history, that you have access to their wiki. And what I always do is in a session, once they claim something, I say, show me. Take me to your confluence, share your screen, um, show me where those guidelines are or those those reports of the threat modeling. Um, yeah, uh, sh show me, don't tell me. And when they know you have access to artifacts, that's sort of a bit of an, an audit effect, but they'll be more truthful. It's also in asking clever questions in the sense that you don't want to suggest what the wrong answer is in your question. No. So if people are not allowed to use internet uh, in a, on a factory floor, for example, and you want to you wanna find out, you're not going to ask, do you use internet on the factory floor? Because they will be saying, no, you're going to ask, so what browser do you use when you when you go to the internet on the factory floor? And then you'll know the answer. It's a bit of a trick, but uh, for for sensitive things, you can you can you can apply this. And um, yeah, last but not least, I guess uh, asking how things went recently uh, instead of how do things uh, normally go, because then will people think, okay, yeah. What are what are our instructions or yeah. what is our policy? That's not the question. The question is, what did you do last time when you found a vulnerability? Uh, just let them storytell more, uh, which brings me to my, my my final thing, which is uh, make it into a conversation, right? I mean, we've all have experience with this during these interviews and notice that when you make it a conversation that doesn't follow the exact topics that you prepared in advance, but you go from A to B to C, just what they want to talk about, go with them. It makes it a conversation. It's quite challenging intellectually because in your mind, you and your colleague need to sort of to tick off the boxes, you know, the topics that were not discussed and the topic that were discussed, so you don't miss anything, but let it flow, let people speak, um, have, create silence, Right. If people answer, yep. just don't say anything. Just sit there, and they will they will add things automatically. Those are some of the tricks uh, up uh, the sleeves of our uh, yeah our job as assessors. Thanks, Rob. 
Uh, Maxim, what are your tricks? Um, I think a lot of them are already best practices. Here. I think, yeah, I think a lot of them are already mentioned. Um, one thing I haven't heard from the others is uh, what I often do is, and this might be part of building a rapport, as Rob mentioned, but I don't try to treat it like this synthetic thing. Um, I ask open-ended questions and I often explain my rationale. So, hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is what the process that I'm looking for. I know you're doing something slightly different, uh, but I, I sketch the context of what I'm looking for and left, let them basically fill in the blanks. Uh, for example, on thread modeling, if a company doesn't do uh, proper thread modeling, but they do architecture design review and they do some, I'd like some people do security analysis, I have like the, the ideal process in my head and I'll explain them like, okay, uh, I've seen this done like so and so and so. Uh, is there something similar that you're doing? And I lead it on, so I, I lead them on basically like, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Um, and by, by basically getting them on my train of thought, um, this often uh, that we're solving the problem together instead of me trying to like poke, or, like pull stuff from their heads. Um, as Rob mentioned, the conversation, like having this conversation, for me, it's really just, I, I, I really do enjoy this. It's not really a trick. I, I'm always interested in how people work. And um, I, I, like, like, I like talking to people, but the pitfall of that is something I had to learn is like to cut off tangents at a certain point. So that is also an important thing. Still keep control of the conversation and guide it as you go. And um, over time, I've become a bit, little bit better in guiding the conversation and keeping it more or less on, on track while still feeling natural. Um, and I have to think, I think all the rest of the, let's say the tricks uh, were mentioned. So. Okay. Well, I think. Thanks guys. I, think I would Maxim, like to. Sorry, Aram. I was, I was going to, I didn't want to oh, miss ahead. this point. I think Maxim brought up an important point there and that was the terminology. So one of the things, like if you ask them, hey, do you have a threat modeling process? And they are not familiar with that term or they're yeah. like, yeah, we have no process named threat modeling. If you have awareness of this where you're like, okay, do you have something that deals, like, do you look at the architecture? Do you look at the design? Yeah. Do you evaluate risks? You know, is there something that keeps you up at night related to how this goes? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, we don't do threat modeling, but we do this. And they start to describe essentially the essence of threat modeling. They just don't call it that. And that's one of the immense values, I think, that you can bring as an assessor is being able to find the work that they're doing that they should get credit for, but they don't realize they should get credit for. And that kind of ties back to the self-assessments. I've seen self-assessments go both directions. I've seen people seriously underscore themselves because they don't, they're not familiar with the terminology. So they're like, I've never heard of this. We must not do it. And then I've seen them overscore because of just pressures and competition but I think terminology is a huge part of that. Um, just trying to help get past that terminology. 